Good morning, Grace Vineyard, and everyone else joining us, listening to this talk via our website or watching it on YouTube. You are very welcome, and I hope this series that we've, this little short series we've done on Advent, is an encouragement to you. And you can find this and many other talks on our website and YouTube channel. My name is Mark Stoneham, and I'm part of the teaching team here at Grace Vineyard. And this is the Christmas Advent season in the church calendar and over the last two weeks we've looked at faith with Jill two weeks ago and hope with Andy last week and this week this morning is our third focus on Advent and we would normally be, be lighting the uh, third candle of our Advent crown the candle of joy so what do we, we perceive joy to be as we approach this Christmas probably with more concerns than any other Christmas that we've had and how does that measure up to God's gift of joy that the Bible tells us about so let's pray before we get started dear Lord thank you for Christmas and especially for this Christmas 2020 and we pray that you will be, you would enable us to receive your joy the joy of Jesus the Savior of the world as we're told to Mary Joseph the shepherds and the Magi by the angels, that first Christmas over 2,000 years ago. Amen. So what do we consider joy to be? Is joy a big pile of Christmas presents under the Christmas tree, a lovely big turkey with family, falling asleep uh, with the Queen's speech in the afternoon or watching the Bond film or whatever it might be that you want to do on Christmas Day? Or is Christmas joy the fact that we've got a vaccine for the virus at last. What about these children? Do you think they've got joy this Christmas? They don't look it, do they? I love the picture, just you know, summed up. <laughs> <They're> little... <laughs> anyway, I won't say anymore. So, have you done all the things you need to do before the 25th of December? There's only 12 days left, you know, to do your Christmas shopping, to get those last-minute treats. The last Saturday before Christmas has been dubbed Panic Saturday and this year according to research by finder.com an average British adult will fork out 476 pounds on Christmas gifts that's only 37 pounds less than last year and so this year it says the UK is planning to spend 24.2 billion on festive gifts even with the the effects of the pandemic with people losing their jobs almost one in five people have said they've bought a last-minute gift for their nearest and dearest on Christmas Eve now I don't think I've ever left it till Christmas Eve to get Christmas present but I do tend to leave things to the last minute so are you at peace expectant and looking forward to Christmas with all your preparation done all happy and joyful like this couple or are you in a panic trying to find that last minute present? So let's just take a minute to check out how we feel about Christmas, particularly this year with all the lockdowns and restrictions that we've had to go through. With some hard decisions about you know, which family members we're actually going to see this year. Are you excited? Are you happy? Or are you a bit frazzled? For many, Christmas can be a lonely time. And more so this year for those who've lost family and friends to this awful virus. So Christmas can have many meanings, emotions and memories, can't it? So this Christmas time, with all that could be going on in our lives, good or bad, where can we find real joy? Well, a joy that won't fade, a joy that goes on and on. We find it in Jesus as we celebrate the birth of the Saviour of the world this Christmas. So let's look at the Christmas story in Luke and see where those in this Bible account of the first Christmas found their joy. So this morning I'm going to look at Mary and Joseph's joy, I'm going to look at the angel and the shepherd's joy, I'm going to look at the Magi's joy and where real joy is to be found. So let's take a first look at Mary and Joseph. Luke 2, 1-7 to 7. 
In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor in Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room for them available. Let's just read that last bit again. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and put him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. So here we have Mary and Joseph in a stable, a smelly stable with smelly cows and donkeys and goats and sheep and chickens and anything else that you know the farmer or the, the innkeeper had lying around. At a first glance, in their circumstances, what have Mary and Joseph got to be joyful about? They are joyful. Because some time before they had to make this journey to Bethlehem, they'd been visited by an angel. And the angel told them not to be afraid, told them about Jesus pending arrival, who he was and what he would do. And in Luke 1, Mary responds like this. My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. So despite all the rumours they may have had to deal with about how and when this baby was conceived, the gossip about them and their morality, in this, let's face it, a really religious and strict society, they were able to rise above it all because they both had the faith and assurance in what God and the angel, God's angel had told them was true, that Jesus was the promised Messiah and he would save all people. No wonder they could have a deep joy and contentment despite their circumstances, because their joy was in the promise and assurance of who this baby was and what he would do. So that's Mary and Joseph. What about the angels and the shepherds' joy? Well, next we come to the second part of the Christmas story. Luke 2, 8 to 14. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. manger. Suddenly a great company of heaven, the host, appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favour rests. Again, it's an angel that God sends to pronounce the birth of Jesus to the shepherds. And a key part of this in verses 10 and 11 do not be afraid, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today most people aren't looking for a saviour because they have little or no concept of being separated from God. They have no understanding of needing to be saved. Saved from what? Our sins? What are sins? In fact, the word sin has little or no meaning today. Unless you're on a diet, and you're allowed a certain number of sins uh, for treats and drinks, for naughty things, while you're on your diet. But for the Jews, and in particular the shepherds, uh, the Messiah, the Saviour, was some they'd been waiting for, for hundreds of years. So once again, the angel has delivered his message, and all heaven explodes and a massive party with the angels unable to contain their joy and excitement that finally God's plan for salvation uh, has begun. And when the angels left the shepherds, they go and they find Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus, just as the angels said they would. And the Bible says, 
uh, in Matthew 2, 17 to 20. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. They had a joy that they'd never known before because God had chosen them, lowly shepherds, to be the first to hear the amazing news that the Saviour had come and they'd seen him with their own eyes. So next we come to the Magi. Matthew 2, 1-12 After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who was being born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he called together all the people, chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Now we know almost nothing about the Magi, or wise men. It's likely, though, that they were descendants from Israelites that had been taken to Babylon in, Babylon, uh, Babylon in the exile in the Old Testament. It's very probable that they were there was a large party of them travelling, not just three of them, if only for security from thieves and bandits on the long journey. They must have been wealthy to have left their livelihoods behind making this long and lengthy journey. And they were obviously well educated because they studied the stars and interpreted the meaning of the stars and that it was significant that their king was going to be born. So they arrive in Jerusalem at Herod's palace and again they must have been important to get in to see Herod in the first place. They probably went to Herod because they assumed a new king would be born in the palace. Herod pumps him for as much detail as he can and then sends him off to Bethlehem with instructions to come back and tell him where Jesus is. And now they see the star, and it says in the passage we read in Matthew, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Finally, after all the deceit of Herod, they are again warned in a dream by an angel, probably the same angel that spoke to Mary and Joseph and the shepherds, uh, not to go back to Herod. So they returned to their country by another way. What is it that made these wealthy men, these educated, important men, make this long journey that culminates in them being so full of joy that they bow down to an 18-month-old baby boy? Only Jesus, the saviour of the world, could bring such joy and response of such worship and adoration. So what does that mean for us this Christmas? We've seen that Mary, and Joseph, the angels, the shepherds and the Magi were told that Jesus was coming. They were told not to be afraid and to receive him as their saviour and king. They did just that. That's where their joy came from. And it's where followers of Jesus have found their joy through the centuries, irrespective of their position or circumstances. The pursuit of happiness is top on most people's agendas today, isn't it? So we get, uh, try diets, we go to gyms, we exercise to make ourselves look better and more attractive. Many believe that more money, a bigger house or a nice car will bring them happiness. But is happiness all there is to life? 
The richest people can often be the unhappiest people in the world. A psychiatrist named Armand Nicoli wrote a study called The Question of God and in it he compared the lives of philosopher Sigmund Freud and C.S. Lewis. Freud was always a very unhappy man, frequently depressed and a co cocaine addict by the age of 28. At 80 years old he said of himself that my mood is bad, little pleases me and my self-criticism has grown more acute. I would diagnose it as senile depression in anybody else. What a sad man. In comparison, though, although C.S. Lewis had a horrible childhood, his mother died when he was young, his father sent him to a boarding school where he was abused, uh, and he looked forward to becoming an adult. He felt he was the most, as he looked forward to becoming an adult, he felt he was the most pessimistic person on the earth. However, at age 30, he found Jesus, or more accurately, Jesus found him. Jesus took him out of himself and C.S. Lewis described his discovery of Jesus as the discovery of joy. He called his autobiography The Sur Surprise by Joy and he said Jesus took him out of himself, out of his self-centeredness and enabled him to focus on others. And of joy, he said this, joy must be sharply distinguished from both happiness and pleasure. Joy in my sense has indeed one characteristic and only one in common with them, the fact that anyone who has experienced it will want it again. I doubt whether anyone who has tasted it, joy, would ever exchange it for all the pleasures in the world. Nothing compares to the joy of the Lord. It's not an emotion, it's a supernatural presence of the Lord in your very being. Let's go back uh, to Luke 2. 10 and 11. Do not be afraid, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. So according to the angel, the great joy of all the people is really only found in the Saviour, Jesus. And according to C.S. Lewis, to discover Jesus is to discover joy. Jesus himself said in John 15, 9 to 11. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Let's look at verse 11 again. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. So in conclusion, it's clear from this brief look at the Christmas story that Mary and Joseph, the shepherds, the angels, the Magi, all found joy in Jesus, the Saviour foretold by the angels. And it's also, also clear that the angels couldn't contain their joy, their excitement and joy at Jesus' birth. C.S. Lewis said that his discovery of Jesus was the discovery of joy. So today, as we approach Christmas, this Christmas that's going to be so different from any other we may have experienced, let's get hold of the good news that will cause great joy for all the people. The good news that Jesus, the Saviour, is here for us, even in the world it is today. And let's receive the joy that only he can give. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that you give you thank you, Lord, for giving up your glory to become a baby and become flesh and blood just like us. Thank you, Jesus, that Christmas is a promise of faith, hope, and especially joy, as we've talked about this morning. Not the temporary fix of fleeting happiness and pleasure that our culture so often mistakes as joy, but the everlasting promise of salvation in and through you, the only Son of God, given to us again this Christmas. Amen. Thank you for listening. You can find out more about our church uh, and the, find more of these talks on our website uh, as it's written down there. So thank you for listening uh, and we're going to go to breakout rooms now uh, in our live uh, Zoom
call. Um, so here are some questions that uh, I want you to think about uh, and talk about in the breakout rooms.